Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Your rich. Slow to anger, your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. And on that day, when my strength is failing, the end draws near. And my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never. Hey everybody, this is Matt. And I'm Erica. And we're here to bring you your announcements today. I was supposed to say that. Hey everybody. Cool. Uh, and we're here uh, bringing you the announcements for today. Alright, so the first announcement is that uh, we have a benevolent. I think you should move it up. I'll do the clicker. Okay. That's actually my announcement. Hey everyone, this is Matt. And I'm Erica, and we're here. Soul. Yeah, that's soul. Ready? Hey, you sit there. You tell mommy. Ready? Say go. 
Hey everyone, this is Matt. And I'm Erica. And we're here today to give you Oak Life announcements. Good. The first announcement is about support for each other. In this uncertain season, let us know if you need support. We're organizing small trauma processing groups and have other resources if you need them. Email leadership at oaklifechurch.com for more info if you need anything. Also, we've set up a COVID-19 benevolence fund for folks who might need some support during this time. If you need support, please email benevolencefund at oaklifechurch.com. Or if you would like to donate, please go to oaklifechurch.com backslash generosity and be sure to designate it as Benevolence Fund. Oak Life Instagram day in life takeovers are happening right now. Follow our stories to see different folks in the community take over the IG for a day and share about what their life is like in this season. We're also looking for folks to take more days. So go ahead and email Sadie if you're interested in doing that. Her email is sadie at oaklifechurch.com. Also, the community justice team would like to thank all the people who joined in contacting local officials and asking them to house unsheltered people during this time. In total, 10 people helped out and made over 35 calls and emails. Great work, Oak Life. I'm so proud to be a part of your community. More progress is underway, and if you would like to get involved, please email Darren at oaklifechurch.com. We're experimenting with the coffee hour on Sundays at 9 a.m. for church service. So if you're interested in hanging out with other people on Google Meet, then Email Chris with your phone number and he'll personally invite you. Coffee hour is again on Google Meet and you need to RSVP by emailing Chris with your phone number. Chris at oaklifechurch.com. We've restarted our weekly check-ins Wednesdays at 1 and Thursday night at 8 o'clock. These are simple ways we can stay connected, share updates, and pray as a family. These check-ins are happening on Google Meet and you need to RSVP by emailing Chris your personal phone number. Chris will then send you the link so you can email him at chris at oaklifechurch.com to get more of this information. Finally, it's time for Couch Conversations. Here we like you to pause the video and talk to someone maybe through text message, through IG, uh, I don't know, TikTok, whatever it is you're using these days, or maybe just reflect on the questions on your own. Also, maybe give yourself a hug, um, talk to a roommate. Your partner. Yeah, if you want to do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> share how you're doing, share something that brings you hope, and then share a hug. I made it. Are you going to edit all that?
When I think of prayers of hope, the first thing that comes to my mind is the unity prayer that circles 12-step communities. I'll share that with you now. I put my hand in yours, and together we can do what we could never do alone. No longer is there a sense of hopelessness. No longer must we each depend upon our own unsteady willpower. We are all together now, reaching out our hands for power and strength greater than ours. And as we join hands, we find love and understanding beyond our wildest dreams. Amen. Well, hey, good morning, Oak Life. Um, nice to be with you all again on um, this online service and a way for us to, to stay connected. Um, thanks for everybody who's put together pieces of today's service. And um, thanks for everyone who's just leaning into community in this time. Uh, my name is Chris, and if I haven't met you yet, um, hopefully we can meet online in some form, and um, and hopefully soon, at some point, we'll be able to meet in person uh, when it's okay, when it's um, safe. Um, hope everyone's doing doing okay. Like I know, you know, probably the first few weeks there's this like adrenaline. Um, we can get through this together, and then there's like a lull. And now we're like, I think we're approaching day 60 of shelter in place. And I hope that um, that wherever you're at, it's okay. And you know, you're not alone. And I think it's okay for there to be ebbs and flows. I know for me, like I've had some really kind of bummer days um, thinking about all the things that aren't happening and the anxieties. And, um, and so I know that all of us are in different places and I'm grateful that we have each other uh, in this. So, um, Today, um, before I get started, I want to uh, just remind you to uh, get communion ready. Um, we're going to be closing out this moment of the reflection, the sermon, with a, uh, a communion together. And uh, so if you need to go get that ready again really quick, go for it. Um, and also, I'm going to be experimenting with a way to do slides. Um, so I'm actually recording myself in a, a Google Meet meeting so that I can share slides. So if you know a better way to do this, let me know, but um, this is an experiment. So there, there'll be a couple moments where it's clunky, um, but just bear with us. We're all learning how to put on YouTube church. Um, and uh, the important thing is that we're together and that we can reflect on God. We can be with God. We can um, thank God for the gifts of whatever this moment is. Um, so maybe uh, before I start, would you take a, a breath with me? And as you breathe in, just acknowledge God's presence with you and uh, be present to your body and think about God and think about community and whatever else is of God. I'd like to start with a quote. Uh, this is um, a quote from, from Emily Dickinson. And uh, this will be my first way to test our slide capability. Um, Here we go. See if this works. Would you look at that? It worked. Woo! Um, by the end of this shelter in place pandemic stuff, I'll know how to do all this really well. Um, this is a quote from Emily Dickinson. Hope, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tunes without words and never stops at all. Today, I'd like to talk with you about hope. Um, I think a pertinent topic for this moment, um, a time of anxiety, a time where our community is still processing stuff that's happened in the last, last month, um, where there is uh, different conversations going around um, going back to normal and, and others saying that this is going to last a long time. And, and then the lived reality of each of us where our families or our apartments or our jobs or everything is just weird. Um, what does it mean to have hope now? What does it mean to have hope in this time? What is hope? And um, this came up a lot for me. Um, and in part, because I don't think we understand hope. 
hope is one of the big things in the Bible. It's one of like Paul's big three, faith, hope, and love. That in the midst of the murkiness of the world, those things remain and love uh, will never fail. And even though there's fogginess and uncertainty, hope is there. Well, what is hope and why does it transcend? Why does it outlive? Um, I think for me, at least, when I hear the word hope initially, it's kind of like a hallmark platitude. It's like a, a slogan on a coffee cup. Um, it's a book title like that just makes you feel warm fuzzies. But I think if we take hope seriously, the force that it is, we'll see that it's way more profound and significant and subversive than some platitude. I think we have hope mixed up with optimism. I think for a lot of us, when we think of hope initially, we picture optimism. Optimism is um, the choice to think that it's all going to work out. Um, and optimism sees a glass half full, even though it might be a little under half full. And I, I think the mix up for us is that um, maybe we don't feel very optimistic right now. Maybe in this moment, like I have no optimism. I'm a pessimist. I don't see how things are going to work out. And we just don't know. And uh, I don't know if you've ever met somebody who's just like brutally optimistic all the time. That's like, no matter what happens, they're like, yeah, it's going to be okay. Um, what often is going on underneath that when people are forcing optimism into hard situations is that there it's a coping mechanism to bypass the reality. And I don't think we can do that. I don't think that's what hope is. I think hope is much deeper and hope acknowledges the moment and transcends the moment. Optimism, I don't think does that. So I thought it'd be a, a, an important reflection for us today. Um, so what is hope? Well, Google defines it as a feeling of expectation and desire for certain things to happen. Womp, womp, womp. Like when I hear that um, definition, I'm like, that, that sounds too superficial. A feeling of expectation, just some feelings. And so I, I scoured the internet trying to find a definition of hope that, um, that rang true in my soul, that, that actually is helpful in this moment, come whatever may. What does it mean to have hope? Well, it's just a feeling that things are going to work out okay. No, I think hope is deeper than that. And here's what I found. Here's what I, I'm, I'm wrestling through. I don't think you can define hope in a soundbite or a, a set of words or a simple definition. I think hope is something that requires a context and a story. It's the same with any of the important uh, transcendent realities like love and our relationship with our kids or a, a, a family member or an experience of the sunset. You can't put it into a sentence. And so hope is all about the context. It's all about what's happening. It's a story where you see, oh, that happened, then that happened, then they got through that. That is what hope is. That's what hope looks like. That's a hope I can lean into. That's a hope I can put my trust in. And so this is actually one of the things I love about the Bible. Um, it is not a, a, a book of heroes. It's not a book of superheroes with special powers who overcome everything because they're just that awesome. Um, even Jesus, God incarnate, suffered. The Bible is filled with people who have been oppressed, who were held captive, who were at the verge of death, who experienced incredible hardship and traumatic moments. And it's within those contexts where we actually see, oh, this is what hope looks like. It's not just a feeling of expectation that things will be okay. It's it's the ability to endure and hold on to something that goes beyond the certain circumstance. And so I think hope acknowledges the darkness. It doesn't avoid it. I want to read a quote to you um, the screen share again. And um, this is Dr. King. And I think it, it portrays the what I'm getting at with hope. Dr. King says, yes, it worked again. Only in the darkness can you see the stars. This is a statement of hope that in the midst of the darkness, the stars come out. Optimism, which I think is something that many of us are just getting tired of in this moment, 
optimism says that when things are dark, like we got we to gotta go find a light switch and turn the switch on and, and we, we got to fix this quickly. Hope, on the other hand, says, no, 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 it's dark right now. Let's be present to it. And in the midst of that, there's something beyond that starts to shine. We start to look up at the stars and see the light from a billion galaxies shining on us, passing through an incomprehensibly large amount of space so that we can behold it. Hope sees the beyond. Optimism avoids the darkness. So what is hope? The Greek word is elpis. And uh, the, the, the wooden definition of elpis is similar to our English translation of hope, that it's an expectation. But what we see in the Bible is that hope is talked about in a certain context. And so I want to read with you a passage from the letter to the church in Rome in the first century. Uh, Paul talking about um, what we place our hope in and why we have a knowledge that there's something beyond, that there is a light from a billion galaxies out there and it's bigger than us. And it's something that transcends this moment and the context being important here. This is why um, I like the word hope because it's not a platitude. It's, it's something that um, has a particular context. Let me show you what I mean. Paul writes, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace, which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into the hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I, I love this passage because it places hope in the context of suffering. We boast in our hope in the glory of God's presence, not because things are great, but even in the midst of suffering, it transforms us and points us to something beyond. Hope in its context is suffering, is struggle, is the darkness. Where hope is most illustrated and defined is not in a soundbite, not when things are going great, but hope is the thing that shines most brightly in the darkest times. So I thought I'd just unpack this a little bit more. Like what is hope and why am I kind of hitting this point of optimism versus hope? It's an important one. I don't think we need to force optimism. I think we can lean into a hope that is beyond all this. And this is one of the things that will sustain us and give us resiliency that we would be able to as a community endure. So hope is way different than optimism. Optimism can often be easy, but hope is something that is earned. Optimism reacts as quickly as possible to a crisis. Hope patiently tends to a crisis with care. Optimism offers empty promises. Hope offers solidarity and presence. Optimism can bypass often but hope endures. Optimism is looking for comfort. Hope brings peace in the midst of suffering. Optimism is convenient, but hope is a struggle. If you've ever had to hold on to hope in dark times, it's not easy. Optimism says, don't focus on the problem. Here's a quick fix. Whereas hope says, we can't avoid the problem Let's let it transform us towards love. Optimism says, don't look at the struggle. Don't look at that. It's going to be okay. But hope acknowledges the struggle and says, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, love will still be there. Optimism elects leaders with quick fixes. Hope finds meaning regardless of who's in office. Optimism loves 
simple solutions and moves on as quickly as it can from damaged things and damaged people and damaged moments. Hope stitches things back together little by little, day by day, faithfully in the midst of damage. Optimism can be taken away and it can be stolen. A lot of my optimism has been taken away. But hope is an internal truth that can never be taken away and never be stolen. Optimism places its ultimate value in itself, in things like health and security and wealth, whereas hope places its ultimate value in transcendent things and meaning, things like compassion and love and justice and faith. See, hope is so different than optimism. My prayer is that we would be a people in this time, a community of hope that is attaching itself not to the circumstantial moment, but to something beyond. And this is what our faith tradition is all about. This is what the Bible is all about. It's story after story after story of people who illustrate for us hope, for people who are living embodied definitions of hope. Hope in the Bible looks like Abraham and Sarah holding on to the promise of God against all odds. It looks like Ruth's, Ruth's commitment to do right by her family, to do what is just and good, even if it means economic or personal devastation. It looks like Shamrach, Meshach, and Abednego holding on to God's presence in the midst of a furnace. It looks like Mary's trust that the scandal of her pregnancy, the political danger that was surrounding her, would not get the last word, but that God's presence, God's promise would prevail. The stars are bigger than this dark moment. Finally, it looks like Jesus's commitment towards sacrificial love, even in the midst of insults and betrayal and unspeakable fame, pain to hold on to something beyond this moment, bigger than this moment, tra more transcendent than this moment. That's the biblical definition of hope. And it's defined by a lived experience, often in the context of struggle and suffering. That's where hope is illustrated. And so I know that that might sound lofty, but the reality is each of us in this time can put our hope in something more. At the very least, the good news of this faith tradition is that God's presence will be there come what may. God's presence in all things and people and creation and every breath, every day that's coming, we have the chance, the opportunity, the privilege, the gift of breathing in God and God's love. That can never be taken away. But there's lots of other things to put our hope in and in, in doing good and helping others and being there for our loved ones and advocating for a certain cause and just being a good friend, whatever it might be. There's something beyond this that we can attach ourselves to, root ourselves in that is bigger than this moment and bigger than any moment. I also want to say that hope isn't just a spiritual conversation. It's not just something religious folks bring up. Um, hope is like a, an actual well-documented uh, physiological, biological thing. Um, as I was doing research this week, I found lots of articles and books that talk about the effects of hope on people and how there's a pattern for people who um, recover from trauma or endure traumatic or challenging circumstances, war and famine and poverty and any sort of devastation, one of the things that helps people prevail is hope. It is not just some abstract idea, but it's a real lived physical aid that I think God has wired in our being. There's a CNN article uh, written by Amanda Inyati, and she says, I don't have this one on the slides, but she says, uh, the positive physiological effects of hope are well documented. Most eloquently in Jerome Groupman's The Anatomy of Hope, where he writes, researchers are learning that a change in mindset has the power to alter our neurochemistry. Belief and expectation, the key elements of hope, can block pain by releasing the brain's endorphins and catholins, mimicking the effects of morphine. 
In some cases, hope can also have important effects on fundamental physiological processes like respiration, circulation, and motor function. How incredible is that, that, that God has wired us, that the image of the divine within us was created to put our hope, to be connected to something beyond any circumstance, and that that thing has an effect on our physio physiology and our, our biochemistry, our neurochemistry. And so hope is different than, than optimism. Optimism doesn't do that. Optimism bypasses the darkness, pretends that it's not there. Hope acknowledges it, but sees something beyond it all. So what does this look like? Um, for me, uh, reminding myself that, that this isn't a unique moment in history has been an important practice. Um, not just that there have been pandemics, but that there have been major struggles and people have gotten through them. People have overcome them. And there are some common denominators that have helped people endure and overcome traumatic, challenging, devastating circumstances. And so I'd like to share three stories. And these, these are well-known stories. Um, maybe they're not as much for some of us, but um, these are people that I've been looking to and reminding myself of, because if they can do it, we can do it. Not in like a go get them way, but in a, they have something that we have too, because we're all humans. Um, so three stories of people who have uh, endured challenges that had something, some ingredient that helped them get through it. The first is Viktor Frankl. Uh, Viktor Frankl was an Austrian uh, neuropsychologist um, or just a psychologist um, who lived during World War II and through the Holocaust. And... Uh, if you read the, the kind of quintessential book is A Man's Search for Meaning and his retelling of the concentration camps. Uh, he lived through four of the concentration camps. All of his family, I think with the exception of one or two, uh, perished in, in the Holocaust. Um, and there's this sense that in the midst of this tragic, traumatic circumstance, he had a hope in something more. And part of that for him was helping others. But what he learned was that um, when we have ourselves attached to something beyond this moment, we can endure. And so a famous quote of his is, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. Another story of people who model and define hope for us is Nelson Mandela, who was in prison for decades uh, during apartheid in South Africa and endured the isolation of prison only to overcome and be a person of reconciliation and healing in his country. And he says, difficulties break some, but make others. No ax is sharp enough to cut the soul of a sinner who keeps on trying, one armed with the hope that he will rise even in the end. May your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. The sense that he will rise again, that this thing will not get the last word, that, that hope would define how he lives now. And finally, Malala Yousafzai who famously was a young woman in her home country and was an advocate for women's education and targeted by the Taliban, was shot in the face, almost died, but was able to overcome and attach herself to a meaning beyond the moment. And that meaning was the success and the flourishing of other young women around the world in women's rights and women's education. She says about the time she was shot, she said that we were scared but our fear was not as strong as our courage. And so here's my question. As you reflect on these stories, maybe there are people in your life who model hope for you. What does it mean for us to be about something beyond this moment that even in this dark moment, the stars are out there. There's something bigger. There's something more. There's something good and beautiful that transcends this moment. What does it mean to have hope in God's presence that will never leave us nor forsake us, that will be with us through it all. How can we be people of hope? What does this look like? Um, I wanna read with you a couple last quotes. This actually is more or less one quote, but it's um, a longer quote. It's fleshed out from Anne Lamott. Um, she says this, hope begins in the dark, this, in the dark. The stubborn hope that if you just show up and try to do the right thing, the dawn will come. 
You wait and watch and work and you don't give up. A great truth attributed to Emily Dickinson is that hope inspires the good to reveal itself. I love that. This is almost all I ever need to remember. Gravity and sadness yank us down and hope gives us a nudge to help one another get back up or to sit with the fallen on the ground in the abyss in solidarity. We live stitch by stitch when we're lucky. If you fixate on the big picture, the whole shebang, the overview, you miss the stitching. And maybe the stitching is crude or it is unraveling, but if it were precise, we'd pretend that life was just fine and running like a Swiss watch. This is not helpful if on the inside our understanding is that life is more like a cuckoo clock with rusty gears. In the aftermath of loss, we do what we've always done. Although we are changed, maybe more afraid, we do what we can as well as we can, stitch by stitch. So I love this message. These people who modeled for us hope, this concept that hope acknowledges the darkness and sees something more and patiently, tenderly, stitch by stitch works to be about good, knowing that this thing will not get the last word. So wherever you're at this morning, maybe for you, this time has been significantly dark because of the isolation. Maybe anxiety or depression is welling up. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe you're uncertain about your job next year. Maybe your savings account is gone. Maybe you've lost your health care. Maybe you're concerned about what's happening the next couple of years. Maybe you know somebody who's been affected directly by COVID-19. Wherever you're at, it's okay. Hope says just be in that moment and start to find within yourself the truth, the good news, that there's something more. That you can choose to lean into hope, not pretending like this isn't dark, but knowing that this thing will not get the last word. This is the essence of the Christian message. That yes, our Savior, God incarnate, was crucified, executed, left for dead, buried, but that the tomb did not get the last word. God entered into darkness, but that darkness did not overcome. The, the proclamation, the invitation is that the tomb does not get the last word. The cross does not get the last word, but resurrection gets the last word. And I know it's a metaphysical claim, and it's something that is beyond our understanding in some ways, but my deepest hope is not in Fauci or a vaccine or my own knowledge or even in all of like us, although you all give me hope. But the deepest hope, the most transcendent home hope is like the light of the stars. This beckoning deep inside of me that there's something more. And that that something is love. And that our story, the, 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 the scripture is a Hebrew Judeo-Christian story, is that love is a conscious thing that is with us and present to us. And that thing will outlast any hell that we go through. Because sometimes we have to go through it to get to the other side. And so when our bodies fail, when things don't work out, hope says, yes, that's real, but it's not the end. Hope doesn't pretend like it's not there. Hope offers us something more. So what is something more for you? Maybe it's just the idea that the sun is rising tomorrow. Maybe it's the idea that you can help somebody and wed yourself or be wed to a cause that brings about good in the world and light in the world. Maybe it's just in the presence of God with you, the beauty all around. Maybe it's in the people you get to be responsible to, that you love and serve and care for. Let's be people of hope. Let's be a community of hope. I think in a time like this, especially in a time like this, our world needs communities that acknowledge the pain of what we're going through, but then see the stars in the midst of the darkness. As we close, um, I'd like us to, um, you can get your elements ready and we'll try communion together. Um, and, and I'm sort of mystic. So um, the bread and the juice are more than just that. 
and the way we do this together, even though we're not in person, we are unified. We're, we're taking communion. We're communing with the divine. We're receiving. We're ingesting. We're being nourished by the divine together. And that force will then become the energy that we walk about our days with. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, God incarnate, love incarnate, hope incarnate, hope embodied. And the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he was with his friends and he looked around the room. He looked them in the eyes, the comfort of a friend, a leader, a teacher, uh, uh, the safety that Jesus was to them. He took bread and he broke it. He said to them, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup and maybe poured it into some sort of communal chalice. As he poured it, he says, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins as a sign of a new way, as a sign of a new covenant, a new hope, something beyond this time, beyond these politics, beyond this pandemic. And as he passed the, blood, the, the bread and they drank the cup, he initiated the most sacred act for Christians, the act of sacrificial love that we then embody. We become what we eat and we do this for others. We give of ourselves for the sake of the world as God did for us. And we receive that love in our being. So would you, in your time, however is appropriate for you, would you take the bread and the juice with your family, by yourself, with your roommates. If you're with people, it might be appropriate to offer it to one another. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins and, and be together in that. And we invite you to receive communion at any point in the next few moments. Um, Andrew is going to lead an, another song for us. And um, the questions I have for us, one, just to reflect on the love of God in this moment but then two, who are people you can look to for hope that model and emulate hope? Maybe it's Jesus. Maybe it's somebody you know. Maybe it's a historical figure. And then how can you be a person of hope in the midst of this time? Um, I'll close this with prayer, and then we'll transition to the song, and you can take communion whatever you want to in there. Let's pray. God of hope, thank you that you're bigger than this even though sometimes it's dark. May our eyes start to adjust that we might see the stars out there, the things beyond, the eternal, whether it's heaven, whether it's justice here on earth, whether it's the relationships with loved ones, whether it's just being present to a meal and a day. May we not give up hope, Lord, May we acknowledge the struggle and the suffering and see that this is when hope shines most clearly. Pray for our community, Lord, for Oak Life, that we would be a light of hope in our world. I pray for our leaders, our country, our world. Be with people making decisions that will affect others. We pray for our medical professionals in this time, Lord. Anyone on the front lines, delivery, service people, firefighters, retail, whoever is out there, would you protect them, Lord? And we pray in Jesus' name against this virus, Lord. May, may it be vanquished. Pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. Oak Life, thank you for being here. Um, and uh, when you're ready, uh, take communion on your own and receive the elements. slaves to these age-old afflictions, fighting for control till we fell too far. Pursue desire, ignore our convictions, only wretched souls beneath the weeping stars. 
we are calling out in the thick of the war. I am standing down to fight for something more. Would we seize these battles? Let this love resound. It's still too hard to find our common ground. There's a fire that stays bold and courageous. There's a light to light the way. There's a fire that stays bold and courageous. There's a light to light the way. And we try so hard to heal our diseases. We break to pieces when our hope has failed. Some will live or die without a reason. Such are the seasons till our faith prevails. We are lost and found and beg to be restored. We keep falling down harder than before. But love will find a way to give us strength to carry on. Sorrow for now, but someday soon be gone. There's a fire. States bold and courageous, there's a light to light the way. There's a fire that stays bold and courageous, there's a light to light the way. So we come and go, it's still a mystery. History long before we find all the secret sins now and forever. We hope for better on the other side. God, hear the cries of your people. God, hear the cries of your people. God, Life, thank you for being with us. Uh, thanks for everyone who contributed to today's service. And uh, um, know that you're not alone. May our hope be in, in the God that transcends this moment. Um, let's continue to find ways to be together and uh, to love one another, to reach out to one another, to pray for each other, and then to, to be the embodied hands and feet of Jesus to our world. Um, so let's uh, close the benediction. And this is the one, this has been kind of the pandemic benediction for now. Um, Oak Life, who can separate us from the love of God? Can troubles or hardships, persecution, hunger, poverty, death, or pandemics? The answer is nothing, absolutely nothing. No matter what comes our way, we have overwhelming victory through God who loves us and gave everything for us. So Oak Life, Go into the coming week with hope and joy, confident in the knowledge that God's love goes with you. Be with us now, God of hope, as we go forth to love and serve the world, whether in person or from a distance. Amen. Okay. Amen. Love you all. We'll see you all soon.
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest strain, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the soul and rock I stand. All the other ground is sinking sand. The darkness tries to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. And every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. All 